Can there be United Ireland? I'm going to give over to Richard now, who's a member of um, our group over in Ireland, Socialist Network, and also a leading member of the People Before Profit campaign. So I'll give over to you, Richard. Yes? Thanks very much, Lola. Uh, yeah, OK, so first of all, I think we need to say it is imperative that as socialists and revolutionaries, we do fight to end partition. Um, why, is that, uh, why is that the case? Well, as James Connolly, the great revolutionary socialist, uh, who at the turn of the century was you know, the leading figure in developing uh, the Irish socialist movement, the Irish trade union movement, and was a leader of the Irish revolt, uh, in 1916, the, the 1916 rising uh, f uh, for which he was ultimately executed. Uh, and, and Connolly warned uh, prophetically that if Ireland was partitioned uh, and it was on the cards that this would be a strategy that was deployed by British imperialism in the face of a rising revolutionary movement challenging British rule uh, in Ireland, uh, that their strategy would be to try and partition if uh, they were facing the likelihood of, if you like, a successful revolutionary upheaval in Ireland, uh, that they would uh, move towards partition as a divide and rule strategy uh, in order to at least, uh, well, first of all, to divide the movement uh, of resistance uh, but also to, to uh, keep hold of as much of the empire as they possibly could, and particularly the economically uh, and industrially strategically important uh, north, which at the time was an important industrial hope for shipbuilding and a key part of if, like, the imperial uh, operation, the imperial uh, enterprise. Uh, so he warned uh, that if partition was successful, it would lead to a carnival of reaction north and south. That's what the, the phrase he used. Uh, and he couldn't have been more correct uh, because the effect of partition uh, when uh, the Irish uh, nationalist leadership signed up to the partition deal uh, at the end of the Irish Revolution in 1922, the deal to partition Ireland, which would give limited uh, independence to the south, the 26 counties in the south, but would leave uh, the six counties of the north uh, under uh, British rule, uh, the effect of that was indeed to create two utterly reactionary states, north and south, uh, where, as he warned, uh, if you like, the most conservative and reactionary forces would dominate in both states. Because instead of, if you like, the political dividing line being a line between the working class uh, and the ruling class, the bourgeoisie, whatever way you want to put it, uh, the political dividing line would be between Catholic uh, and Protestant, creating a state in the north uh, with a Protestant inbuilt uh, majority, uh, and that, that would reinforce the most reactionary forces of loyalism and unionism, loyal uh, to the British Empire, encouraging an idea among Protestant working class people that they had something to gain from staying loyal to, being, to Britain and being part of the empire, and that they would enjoy privileges and benefits over and above if a, a backward, poor uh, Catholic uh, working class uh, who were the majority uh, in uh, the South. And that is indeed what happened. Eamon will probably go into this uh, in a bit more detail, but in the North, what was created was effectively a one-party state dominated by uh, the Unionist Party. Uh, I mean, the extent of, if you like, what a rotten regime this was uh, is... Uh, exemplified by the fact that for most of the history of this state, up until the civil rights movement breaks out in the late 1960s, of which Eamon McCann was a leading uh, member, uh, the only one opposition bill ever passed in the Northern, uh, in the Northern Parliament that was dominated by the Uni Unionist Party, which was the Wild Birds Act of, I think, 1967. 
because presumably you couldn't discriminate Catholic from Protestant birds. But in every, in every other respect, uh, this was a state which was based on institutionalized sectarianism and discrimination against uh, the Catholic minority, uh, often then enforced by pogroms uh, and uh, you know, violent suppression of efforts by the Catholic population to challenge the inequality, the discrimination they faced in employment, in housing, uh, and so on. So this was an absolutely rotten state dominated by uh, the most reactionary uh, forces and where the official ideology was essentially a racist ideology against the Catholics that celebrated uh, the defeat uh, uh, of the Catholics at the hands uh, of William of Orange and so on. Uh, in the South, uh, similarly, you had a rotten reactionary state. Uh, I mean, to detail just how rotten it was, uh, I mean, one of the really horrible aspects of it was the, uh, the treatment of women in the Southern Irish, in the Southern Irish state, uh, and particularly working class women, and indeed their children. Uh, so the Southern Irish state, one of the horrible features of it, something that really, it's only in very recent years and still not fully, have uh, there been an acknowledgement of the great crimes that were done against Irish women in this uh, newly founded state, which was supposed to be a state that was liberating itself from the chains of imperial oppression, but actually what it ushered in was a state in which the Catholic Church absolutely dominated uh, the, uh, the, the, the two major parties, Fianna Fáil and Fianna Gael, both of whom would come out of Sinn Féin, but were essentially conservative, middle-class, uh, Catholic nationalists use the Catholic Church as a major institution to essentially keep working class people down uh, and the greatest victims of that were women, working class women in particular. So you had this huge uh, set of institutions controlled by the church where they control the health service uh, and we had these horrible institutions uh, called uh, Magdalene Laundries where women who had had children where they weren't married were essentially uh, deemed pariahs uh, who had to be effectively locked up in these Magdalene laundries and treated as slaves, uh, most often suffering the most horrendous uh, abuse, uh, violence, uh, and, and treated as slaves by the, by the Catholic uh, Church. Decades and decades of this, and these institutions stayed operating right up until the 1980s. In Ireland, I mean, really quite extraordinary uh, treatment of women just because they, uh, their lives, if you like, were outside the rules of the Catholic Church in terms of marriage uh, and having children. Uh, horrendous, and of course, the treatment of the children in these institutions, the industrial schools, with these other things called industrial schools, were essentially poor working class children who maybe got themselves in a little bit of trouble when they were fifteen or sixteen, were essentially jailed. Uh, and treated as slaves, suffered terrible, terrible abuse again at the hands of the Catholic Church, and this horrible collusion between church and state uh, to maintain these institutions and the horrible abuse of children and so on. And then the mother and baby homes, another part of this where women who were uh, pregnant with children, where they were outside marriage and so on, uh, were locked away. Uh, their children taken off them, uh, effectively taken off them, uh, often illegally adopted, uh, you know, really, I mean, it's just an incredibly rotten uh, situation for women and more generally for working class people. I mean, right up into the 1980s, we had mass emigration out of Ireland, such was the extent of poverty, of unemployment, uh, up until, you know, when I was a youngster in the mid-1980s, uh, there were still 40,000 Irish people leaving a year, mass emigration, course to Britain, to the United States, to Australia and so on, such was the level of poverty, mass unemployment uh, in the South in a state dominated by very, very conservative uh, right-wing uh, right political uh, forces. So this was the reality to rotten stage, states as Connolly uh, predicted it. Now was all this inevitable? Uh, and some would say it is, you know, a little bit like the Palestinians and uh, the conflict of the Palestinians and Jews. There's a certain narrative which says Jews and Arabs just can never get on. That's why we have conflict in, in, in Palestine. It's got nothing to do with imperialism, actually using divide and rule tactics in order to control an area and divide people and set them uh, at each other's throats. And in fact, Ireland was the model 
for what they actually imposed on Palestine. Often the very same key figures were the architects of what would, of the system. We now call it apartheid. In Ireland, it was initially called things like penal laws, a set of institutionalized apartheid rules that discriminated between Catholic against Catholic, uh, between Catholic and Protestant, and so on, to set people against one another and divide possible resistance uh, to British uh, rules. So the point is, I certainly would argue, uh, it, it, this was not inevitable. Partition was not inevitable. Uh, it arose from a, a political strategy of divide and rule, particularly orchestrated by the Tories, latching on to the most reactionary elements uh, in political unionism among, if you like, the Protestant uh, industrialists and Protestant uh, upper middle class and so on to divide Catholic and Protestant workers in order to keep uh, working people down and to keep the empire, to sustain uh, the empire and its exploitation, uh, its exploitation uh, of Ireland. But why did, uh, why did it succeed? Why did this strategy succeed? And I would say there were two central reasons. Number one, that uh, the, uh, if you like, unionism, orangeism could uh, imply or suggest to Protestant working class people somehow there was a benefit for them being part of the em empire. Economic advantages over their Catholic brothers and sisters uh, and being part of the empire as against being part of a backward, Catholic church-dominated do uh, and extremely poor uh, Southern Ireland. Uh, so that was, if you like, a key part of the narrative, was the backwardness, there was nothing in it for Protestant workers to be part of the United Ireland, to break through the chains of sectarianism uh, and actually fight the empire and, and see, if you like, the real division being uh, class rather than creed. Uh, five minutes, right. I have to fly through this. Uh, the, uh, uh, and uh, secondly, I think, and this is the key point, is politics. Uh, the political leadership of the Irish National Revolutionary Movement, uh, I mean, who were the forces that were dominating it? And James Connolly, of course, was Ireland's greatest socialist, understood the danger of the division of the working class, had organised among Protestant workers north and south, uh, had been involved in strike and industrial action and so on, north and south, and was absolutely committed to uniting Catholic and Protestant workers against that divide and rule uh, tactic. But tragically, Connolly was killed, and he did not leave a legacy of a strong socialist organisation. And insofar as a Labour Party that he'd helped found and a trade union leadership that he'd helped found uh, were factors in the debate during the Irish Revolution between 1918 and 1921. Essentially, they abdicated responsibility to take a lead in the debate about what kind of Ireland was going to come after, uh, what, you know, what, what was the revolution fighting for. The uh, conservative nationalists were very clear. They certainly weren't sympathising, but as many workers in Ireland were, sympathising with the wave of revolutionary struggle that was sweeping Europe, the Russian Revolution and so on, which had a huge influence in Ireland during that period. I've got time to go into the details between, but just to give you an example, between 1918 and 1921, there were hundreds, and they were called Soviets, set up in Ireland as workers rose up as part of the struggle against the British Empire, but the working class taking it much further and actually uh, inspired by the ideas of the Russian Revolution, talking the language of socialist revolution and setting up institutions, not exactly the same as the Russian Soviets, but, inter but inspired uh, by them. So the potential for a different type of revolutionary leadership was there, but tragically, the, uh, what was left of the left, if you like, were saying labor must wait. They bought into the idea that the left should hold back on its more radical demands in order to first achieve liberation from uh, Britain. And the consequences were that right-wing nationalism dominated, made a deal that partitioned the state, and then the state that was ushered in was that reactionary state uh, that we're uh, talking about. A disastrous decision, and that was the consequences. But the point I'm making is, not inevitable, uh, it's a political question. Uh, now, if you think about those being two of the key factors in allowing this terrible partition strategy and the consequences that it results in, if they were, as I would argue, two of the major reasons the British could get away with this, what are, how are those conditions now in terms of, one, the perception that Protestant workers might be encouraged to believe, although it was never really true, in fact, 
uh, and again, I haven't got time to go into the details, but Protestant workers, as Eamon McCann very famously put it, were tuppence halfpenny looking down on tuppence. They might have seemed to be in a slightly better position in terms of their Catholic uh, working class counterparts, but in reality, the divisions uh, had dire consequences for, for everybody in the North, Catholic and Protestant working class people. You know, for example, it's the only place in the UK where the abortion rights are still not accessible, even now. But that's what the division did. It copper fastened the most reactionary and conservative forces affecting Catholic and Protestant uh, women. Uh, it meant uh, uh, poverty, uh, wages, much lower wages than the rest of the UK and so on and so forth. But the point is these things, any perception of benefit is now gone because what you have is equality and poverty for Catholic and Protestant workers. You still don't have abortion rights uh, for women, but also the idea that the South is inherently uh, a backward place actually has been changed radically by uh, the radicalization that's happening in the South against the rotten state I've described, against the Fianna Fáil, Fine Gael, who like the Unionists completely dominated the Irish Southern state for 70, or for 80, 85 years, but now their grip and the grip of the Catholic Church have been substantially weakened. Uh, so Fianna Fáil, Fianna Gael are now well below 50% who dominated the state for its whole history. The, the, even the re revolutionary left, I mean, there are now more Trotskyists in the Irish Parliament in Dublin than there are Fianna Fáil TDs, right? <laughs> <laughs> But also, we had an absolutely enormous struggle for the repeal of the Eighth Amendment, which prevented the right of abortion in Ireland, and we won that spectacularly against the resistance of the Conservative Catholic forces in the Irish state. We're the first country in the world, through a popular referendum, to, get, to grant ma marriage equality for LGBTQ uh, people. Again, coming from below, coming through struggle. So the idea that, if you like, uh, it's a backward, conservative-dominated state has been challenged, even though it's still, to some extent, dominated by Fianna Fáil and Fine Gael, and the last residues of Catholic control still remain, and in health and education in particular, there is a serious challenge to those things. And certainly it could not be argued uh, that being part of United Ireland inevitably means going backwards uh, economically or socially. It's still, it's very much up for grabs. And so therefore, the, the subjective question is terribly important. And I'll conclude on this. I mean, insofar as Sinn Féin see uh, a, a way forward for United Ireland, and now the Catholic and Protestant population in the North are more or less the same percentage, Sinn Féin are now the biggest political party in the Northern Assembly, a historic change. So the union is, if you like, in a minority for the first time. But there is still uh, divisions. But Sinn Féin essentially have, have argued that it's, if you like, it's through love bombing unionism, as opposed to actually bombing unionism in the previous, that we now love bomb unionism, uh, uh, and also through demographic changes where Catholics essentially eventually outnumber the Protestants, that we're going to get there for United Ireland, right? Now, the problem with that is it doesn't really challenge the institutionalized sectarianism that, that still operates within the Good Friday Agreement, where essentially everybody has to designate themselves Catholic and Protestant, where every single economic and social issue is seen as a zero-sum game, where Catholics or Protestants are going to lose out, and where sectarianism still persists. Uh, it doesn't really challenge that, and I would argue never can, because it has nothing to offer Protestant workers. What does have something to offer Protestant workers, where opinions are changing, and I haven't got time to go through the figures, but where it is now, there's a, what would happen if there was a border poll, which we are actively campaigning on, things are getting much closer, and there's a huge number of people who've broken away from unionism, uh, but aren't entirely convinced yet they should be part of uh, United Ireland. How do you convince them? It's precisely by raising the, the issues of common interest to working class people and progressive people north and south. Whether it's fighting to get abortion rights in the north, fighting to get you know, rights for LGBTQ uh, people, whether it's the cost of living issues which are uniting people, or even the electrifying sort of impact of people like Mick Lynch and the rail strike. I'm sure Eamon is very fond of trains. He might talk about that uh, in, uh, in, a, in a minute. About that how those sort of issues can unite working class people. So in other words, it's in fighting for a radical socialist vision of Ireland, North and South, a different kind of Ireland, not just about knitting together two reactionary states and accepting that a division as being somehow a permanent division between Catholic and Protestant, but challenging that sectarian idea and uniting people on a class basis, on a fight 
for genuine liberation for women, for LGBT people, uh, for, and for the working class uh, in general. And that is the project which people before profit are committed to both north and south. I believe that we have Eamon coming in now on Zoom, um, which is finally working. Uh, Eamon McCann is a former elected member of the MLA, um, a major campaigner for the victims of Bloody Sunday, and also author of this book, War and an Irish Town, which you can get at the bookmark stall over there. I've, if he's ready to come in on Zoom, I think we're ready too. Okay, okay. I'm finding it very difficult to hear anything from your side. This is probably to do with my uh headphones or earphones whatever they're called uh but on the assumption that somebody is listening uh which is not always the case when i speak uh, i i i was struck by a richard's remark a few moments ago uh, uh i suppose you meant in the semi uh, flippant way it says that you know Eamon's very interested in trains and indeed i am and uh, when we talk about the national question in Ireland and when we talk about a progress towards a, a united Ireland, trains are quite important. Uh, the, the, I'm a member of a group called Into the West, which is a campaign to extend the rail line through Derry uh, into Donegal and Sligo across the border out of, and uh, a, down through uh, a, the west of Ireland. And uh, a, one of the arguments uh, which can be made about that is a sort of a, a, a is a threat to the train line between Belfast and Derry. Just a uh, very few years ago, about uh, fifteen years ago, and the decision had been made to close it, which would have left Derry in the northwest without any real link at all uh, to anywhere. And uh, uh, this is an example, really, of the way campaigning can actually work. The campaign into the west, a strange name, but a very memorable name, sort of once you get used to it. The real campaign into the west. So most people in Northern Ireland and some in the south will know exactly what you're talking about when you say uh, into the west. Into the west began when we had a knock on the front door by half past ten one Sunday night and there was a man standing there when Goretti, my partner, uh, opened it whom we had never seen before and he said, I'm Colm Joyce, I'm a shop steward for train drivers and they're closing the line. Can I come in and talk to you about what we can do about that? It's as simple as that. You think, yes, come in, gathered a few people together and including one of the wonderful things about um, campaigns in relation to real is that there are hundreds of thousands of people everywhere who are train spotters. I'm not a train spotter, but we've got people I know who will tell you not only when the first line from Darlington to a, 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 a I actually forget now sort of what exactly uh, it was, but it was a wonderful innovation. You know, and sorry, I can go on for hours about trains, which I won't, which I won't. But when we're talking about history and the history of bringing uh, regions together and bringing working class people together, it should sometimes be kept in mind that sort of railways were an absolutely magical invention, a magical invention. Sort of uh, when the first passenger trains came uh, uh, online in the uh, uh, 1850s, nobody in human history had ever travelled in such numbers, at such speed, over such distances, ever, ever. I mean, go back chariots and all the rest, but they didn't come close. It was a revolutionary thing. And it drew people together. And in Ireland, it was very important. The rivers were built by the British, sort of, uh, uh, in Ireland. Who else was going to build them when they owned everything, sort of, and ran everything? Uh, and uh, they built sort of the railways in Ireland as an all Ireland uh, a network. Um, they're owned by the, the, the lines into Derry. There used to be four lines into Derry, and the two main ones are called the Great Northern Railway and the London, Midland, and Scottish. Now, there's a name for a, a rail line in Ireland, the London, <laughs> Midland, and Scottish uh, a rail company. And uh, a, 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 they existed. For all those years, they were begun to be decimated at the time of the same was happening uh, in Britain, the Beeching Report, out of, uh, uh, which uh, slashed the railways 
uh, in uh, Britain. So I'm under the Tory government, of course, and they uh, hated the public sector and uh, they favoured individual travel as opposed to mass travel. I mean, trains are democratic uh, uh, and they kept carrying lots of people and so forth. And they, they wanted to close it down and they wanted to close the line to Derry precisely because Derry, as unionists would have seen it, the unionist government would have seen it, was a hotbed a hotbed of nationalism. Now, when we took up the fight against that, one thing immediately became clear. If we were going to extend, refurbish, stop the closure, stop the closure of the Derry rail line and expand the rail network back where it was. Before, if you look at a map of rail sort of on the island of Ireland eh, from the 1920s and 1930s, there are roads and railways everywhere. There are loads, big and small. There are uh, a, a uh, little a, a railway, some of them locally owned, but most of them owned by a big transport, big rail uh, a, a, a companies. If you wanted to expand the railway from Derry, it had to be on a cross-border basis. There's no other way of doing it. Where were you going to go after the line came from Belfast? If you wanted to expand sort of down in the west of Ireland, uh, uh, it had to be a 32 county effort. And then account of that, sorry to go on so long about this, but I thought it was a wonderful development. Within six months of us this, uh, uh, establishing into the west, uh, uh, in Derry, we had connections with other real campaigns in Southern Ireland, right up to sort of the west, uh, uh, in the west of Ireland, Connemara, up through Sligo and Donegal, little railway campaigns everywhere who were quickly in touch, sort of, and we got to know people very quickly, sort of in those who were also campaigning for real and making the same arguments. And one of the key arguments, of course, for real at the moment is environmental. This is the cleanest, the cleanest form sort of, of mass transportation ever invented was the train. So you can argue and locate that argument, not only in terms of the geographical location, sort of, and the need for equity and public services and so forth, but it fits very naturally into the uh, argument about saving the uh, uh, environment. And as you say, it's all Ireland of necessity. There's a we're fighting along those lines of today. And one of the things that you should keep in mind is sort of when you have everybody in that campaign, Right, there's the north of Ireland trying to get to, uh, a extensions as well, sort of the different parts of the Northern Ireland to Oma, to Enniskillen, uh, um, and so forth, which is over uh, towards the west. Uh, everybody knows that this is the 30 county, 32 county uh, effort. Everybody, whatever the religious background, knows that we're not going to succeed in doing that in the north unless we also uh, 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 win that in the south of Ireland. It's simple. I mean, there's no way for the, there's no uh, uh, relay rail lines in the south of Ireland, there's no line to actually uh, uh, continue uh, the line from Derry to Belfast Derry. If there's no line over the border, I mean, where's it going to continue? Uh, to? There's nowhere service out of the small towns of uh, Donegal. As it used to, as it used to, the real, uh, uh, as the real was used to. So it's an all-Ireland campaign of its nature. And thus you have to, if you're lobbying, if you're campaigning, if you're putting on pickets, it has to be on an all-Ireland basis. It doesn't matter about what you thought of the of partition that before that came about. And working like that, it struck me sort of in this little real campaign, which started from nothing, started in our front room and there were three people uh, I, the, 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 uh, into the West campaign. And a very quick jump, you're from that into uh, all Ireland. Of necessity, you're into uh, an all Ireland. And there's a lesson in that. There's a lesson in that. If you want to make advances on all sorts of issues, north and south, it has to be an all-Ireland campaign. The, uh, the Richard talked towards the end of his talk there about the campaign uh, uh, for women's rights uh, a, uh, in Ireland, north and south. Now, there was a bit very successful in the uh, south of Ireland and getting changes over the past few years. We now have... You know, uh, 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 not only we've got a gay rights sort of in the South and women's rights and codified, that doesn't mean that problems have gone away, of course, but at least it's codified, uh, uh, it's codified in the law. And indeed that's gone, is it where uh, uh, sometimes listening to sort of the nonsense talk by anti-trans people, sort of um, anti-trans people sort of across the water, sort of in uh, England mainly, sort of, um, I'm sometimes reminded that Ireland, Southern Ireland, is priest-ridden, you know, dark hole, sort of in the international uh, IAA map, was the first country in the world to have gender self-identification with regard to gender achieved by uh, a referendum. Now just think about that. 
you know, sort of a cut through sort of it. And on an all Ireland basis, has happened uh, uh, the campaign sort of uh, uh, goes on. If it's achieved in the South, we can get it. And I can illustrate that. Some years ago, there was, uh, about five years ago, I suppose it was, the, uh, the uh, Equal Marriage a campaign. So I was running in the uh, South of Ireland. And it won, of course. There was 80%, I think it was, a uh, um, majority, huge majority for Equal Marriage. The reasons for that change as well, which won't be too long uh, to go into. But I remember watching the uh, announcement of the result of the referendum, and uh, the referendum result was announced in the grounds of uh, Dublin Castle, the old centre sort of a British imperial rule for so many years sort of, uh, uh, in Dublin, which is packed by people, packed by people, thousands of people there waiting for the result of the referendum to be announced sort of uh, a, from the little platform. A, a, uh, down there uh, in, uh, in Dublin. And I was watching this, and there's a, it was a wonderful scene. It's a wonderful scene. It was packed with people, everybody happy, overwhelmingly women. Uh, uh, and, uh, 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 and there was a, an, a placard held up from in the crowd after it was announced, and there was huge celebrations, and everybody went demented for a wee while and cheers and all that there and kissed one another, sort of. Uh, you know, so that was wrong, but in the middle of it, there was a placard being held up, being held up by a woman towards the back of the crowd. I was standing in a little raised place. Uh, the crowd, not that I was on a platform or anything, it had nothing to do with me. Uh, 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 I saw this, a woman holding up a placard saying, the North is next. You know, uh, uh, and you know, that placard was to end up on the little platform. Uh, it was taken from her, not grabbed from her, there's as far the two main leaders of Sinn Féin in Ireland, Mary Lou Macdonald in Southern Ireland and uh, uh, Michelle O'Neill in Northern Ireland, were coming up towards this platform. All the main parties were making little speeches about how, uh, how they did it. And they asked them, didn't grab it from her, but they asked her, could they take the placard up with them? And they did. The North is next. Huge applause, huge cheers uh, from the crowd. A expression sort of of a 32 county thing. Uh, uh, of the, uh, the, the, the key point I'm making, sort of in telling you that, is that the woman concerned who had come from Belfast on a bus, sort of with the other activists uh, from Belfast, was the daughter of Sir Geoffrey Donaldson, now the leader of the Democratic Unionist Party. You know, now there's a, a little sort of example of the way in which sort of issues like a, a which they do sort of with. Uh, a gay liberation, sort of women's rights and such things. Of all, you know, they unite people because they affect people on both sides. The women's movement in Ireland and the gay movement uh, uh, in Ireland over this past 10 years has provided example after example of 32 county all Ireland uh, uh, action. Not just as I say, minor part, the real campaign, but also things like sort of women's rights and gay liberation. Uh, uh, and all the rest of it. And I remember thinking at Dublin Castle, there's something profound going on here. There is, I mean, the daughter of the leader of one of the Unionist parties travels from Belfast to say the North is next, you know, um, in Dublin. You know, and what was really interesting about that, I think, nobody that I knew him standing around me, nobody said, isn't this terribly interesting? It's the 32 county, but it was just taken for granted. Of course we wanted the same things in the North as had been uh, achieved or were in the course of being achieved uh, uh, in the South. So this wasn't a demonstration for a united Ireland. It was a demonstration of a united Ireland. And that seems to me to be a great advance sort of, and where we were before. And that is true. And over this past, you know, uh, a few months, I mean, we've had sort of the public sector uh, uh, issues of the wage issues of wages in the public sector and so on in Northern Ireland, as in across the water, because they're all part of the same state and sort of the uh, 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 so forth. Uh, uh, and that's happening in the South as well. There's big demonstrations. Never have there been so many demonstrations for progressive causes and working class causes in Ireland in my lifetime. And they are happening simultaneously, North and South. It seems to me that therein lies the key to the question of how do we get a united Ireland. I believe it's actually staring us in the face. And I do think that in all sides there ought to be much, much more recognition of that. It ought to be far higher on our list of priorities and to be stated in our uh, uh, list of priorities. Remember that the advances which have been won 
that I've noticed during the last 10 years, say, uh, in Ireland, have all been won by mass movements. They've been won by the mass mobilization uh, uh, of people. None of them has been won simply by enlightened legislators uh, being persuaded, you know, that they ought to do these things. They've been won sort of by the pressure from below, every one of them. I mean, one there. There's a lesson in that too, sort of about the way in which, you know, sort of, uh, the, a lot of comrades will have, you know, memory of a, a of sort of the various issues and campaigns that we've all been involved in down through the years, down through the decades, and so forth. So sometimes you win, and that you win a particular thing, and there's nothing a, 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 but it, a, a, where it makes a difference to the way people think is when it is done from below. There's no other way of doing it. You know, legislation doesn't change people's minds. People's minds change legislation. I mean, that's sort of one of the bedrocks of the idea of uh, uh, socialism, socialism from below. So it's not, if you, it, 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 that sense of achievement, that sense of, we did this, we did this, well, not thank you for doing it for us, and, uh, uh, but we did this. And that is very palpable to an extent that I have never experienced before in my long sort of history. Uh, 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 of campaigning sort of on progressive, I hope, sort of uh, issues of one uh, uh, kind and another. It, it, it was a, well, it, the best demonstrations I've ever been asked have been, uh, been at uh, in my life. I've been in County Donegal over the past couple of years. I mean, one was the first ever Pride March in Bunkrana, which is uh, 13 miles uh, from Derry. It's not a very enlightened place. Never was a very enlightened place. And the Donegal was the only one of the 32 counties of Ireland which voted no, which voted no to uh, uh, equal marriage. Everybody else was on board, apart from Donegal, reaction the only rural place. Uh, about three weeks ago, about three weeks ago was the first Pride March uh, in Donegal. It was in Bunkrana. We went down a whole contingent of us. Uh, I went down, uh, down uh, uh, from Derry. There were, it never happened before. There were thousands of people from Bunkrana onto the streets. A lovely uh, sunny afternoon. It was colourful, people in all sorts of costumes and uh, uh, all the rest of it and chanting. And along the road through the main street in uh, Bunkrana, it was lined two, three deep with people from Bunkrana all applauding all sort of with smiles on their faces. And I thought, what a transformation. What a transformation. How did that come about? Well, it came about mainly because young women in Ireland, young women in Donegal and in Bunkrana had taken this on themselves and by sheer numbers sort of in camp campaigning had changed the situation. For, uh, for the, It seems to me, sir, it, 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 that there's a profound lesson in that about the way uh, I, that we proceed. And that that lesson includes lessons to do with how do we get a united Ireland. Now, I agree sort of with um, people who say that a united Ireland has never been closer than it is at the moment. Okay, that's sort of, you don't have to read a couple of newspapers and you'll find that that's why everybody's talking about a united Ireland and the way that they went uh, uh, before. And um, one of the key aspects of the campaign for united Ireland is this, that, the campaign for Britain to take its political influence as well as its military and security uh, influence out of Ireland uh, is shared by the British ruling class. They don't want to be in Northern Ireland. And all the arguments in recent weeks sort of about the protocol and all that uh, a business, I haven't heard anybody, uh, including people in the Conservative Party, not one stand up and talk about our kith and kin. We will not desert our kith and kin in Northern Ireland. Not even what Rhys Mogg says that. None of them say that. In Northern Ireland, they don't care about it. What's more, that is widespread. The people from England listening to this at the moment, if you ask yourselves, that when have you heard your workmates or your neighbours or classmates in universities or whatever, wherever you come from, when have you ever heard a passionate argument about this? Yeah, we will not leave Northern Ireland. It is part of us. You know, part. Never do you hear that. I worked for years in London. You know, sort of, and got on very well, sort of, with everybody I worked with. It cures me, it cured me of anti English nationalism. And one of my closest friends on uh, the job where I worked was for the Greater London Council uh, at that time. Uh, one of my friends, uh, uh, Roddy Firth, you know, I got very friendly with him, he knew his family and, and so forth. We we're going to work one morning. We worked and went on a transit van. I worked with Ripping and Epping Forest. And uh, when we were in transit van, we used to do all sorts of uh, things which I didn't know English people <laughs> uh, uh, would do, singing Cockney songs and singing Jerusalem 
There's the sort of something you don't hear about. See, lustily, everybody knew the words of Jerusalem. But we were going to work one morning, and Roddy, Roddy Firth, my friend, turned around, he was in the seats in front of me, and said, just tell me one thing, I mean, which part of Ireland do we own? And I understand that you don't own any part of it, uh, uh, eh, Roddy. But he, he didn't mean the question in an aggressive or hostile way. He was genuinely asking for information. He wanted to know, because I was talking about Ireland, as I would on occasion, which part do we own? It was that I wasn't offended by it. I knew what I was doing. I did explain to him about not owning uh, um, any part of it. And that was common. That was common, sort of, in my experience, sort of, of uh, working in England. I worked in uh, London altogether for uh, seven years. You know, enjoyed myself and liked almost everybody that I met over there. But it was very striking that none of them regarded Northern Ireland as part of their country. None of them had a yearning. They would uh, uh, maintain the connection. None of them were unionists, in other words. You see, and that goes back a bit. You know, it, I mean, the, uh, the British Conservative Party in the 1970s, just after the first the, the outbreak of the Troubles, made a play to every, anybody who would listen, listen to them that the government, the government in London, the Tories, didn't really want to hold on to Northern Ireland, which contradicted all my want people to be able to make contributions. We're going to skip the icebreaker part of the meeting just so we can get to your questions. Uh, thank you very much for the talk from both Richard and Eamon. Uh, Richard, you said some at the start where the Conley didn't leave behind a legacy. I think based on what both you Sorry. and Eamon have said, that's the legacy itself, where you have a 32 county that you have the trains uniting it all across the 32 counties. That's exactly what Conley campaigned for. He lived in Belfast for a number of years. Like working across, like he didn't give, he couldn't care less what sectarianism. He would go to both sides, and as you said, it was divide and conquer. Where the partition was, they saw the workers of Belfast and the workers in Dublin start to unite, and they were starting to form trade unions, yeah. devoid of religion, and that's what terrified the empire the most. And also in terms of, so the North is next. I remember seeing that, and I actually got quite upset whenever I saw it because I knew full well that with the partition of concern instalments which gives 40 MLAs, which is easily the unionist majority, and it's the DUP, and they are the most uh, Christian extremist fundamentalists mm -hmm. you'll ever meet. And I knew full well that the, it's 75% in opinion polls for marriage equality and women's right to choose, but as long as the likes of the DUP have that absolute control over the government, that's not going to change. Which is why more than ever we need a united order to finally kick the bite and get a voice for the people. Thank you. I'm just also, um, if you can keep your contributions to three minutes, I'll time you and I'll tell you at one minute that you have one minute left. Okay, I just wanted to say a bit more about the repeal campaign that uh, both Richard Name and referred to. Um, the technicalities of, you know, why it was called repeal, I won't bother wasting time on, but suffice it to say, it was, it was a very restrictive um, piece of legislation that copper fastened uh, a woman's um, denial of abortion rights that, uh, that we, as Richard stated, uh, overturned. We got rid of that, and it was, as the point was made again, we got rid of it. Um, I was involved as one of the uh, coordinators of the campaign in, in the constituency I work in as a part of the people for profit. And uh, the first night I remember we called uh, a canvassing group. We had been building for the campaign for six months, but the first night we were hoping people would come with us uh, to canvass. We knew it would be a hard call, knocking on doors, having <coughs> what we anticipated would be difficult arguments with people. We thought if we were lucky, we'd get a half a dozen people. A dozen showed up. The next night there were 20. The next night there were 50. And before the end of the week, there were over 200 people showing up for local uh, and 
making the arguments that were received, you know, really incredibly well uh, by people of my generation. My generation was the, were the ones who lived under the jackboot of the Catholic Church, where even to mention the word abortion was a sin. Uh, and, and we overturned it in magnificent numbers. Now, the, the point of, 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 it's not just, you know, blowing our own trumpet on this, um, but it is to say that in a country that was as so dominated by the Catholic Church, as was Ireland, so that we got things like the Magdalene laundries, the mother and baby homes, where they, they took women's babies from them and sold them, uh, despite, you know, without permission, etc. cetera, horrors. And, and by the way, Richard, the last Magdalene Laundry closed in 1996 in mm -hmm. Dublin. Uh, if, if abortion rights can be won in a country like that, then there's hope for us all. And I say that because when you look at the dark days that are upon us in places like Poland and in what's happened in America, you know, it can be really intimidating. But, uh, but everyone should know the story of Irish repeal and take heart in it. I'm going to come around. Yeah. Hi there, yeah. Uh, yeah, as a, uh, a socialist involved in the independence movement in Scotland, uh, I think it's important to say that we feel we're fighting a common cause here. Because it would only be the great victories for working class people to smash part of the British state for all its reactionary history. And so, United Ireland. Independence for Scotland, I think, go hand in hand. Uh, and it's one of the interesting things, I think. Uh, I mean, uh, Eamon talked about the, the ruling class's attitude uh, towards the United Ireland. Uh, but in Scotland, there is the remnants of unionism still in Scotland. And actually, a lot of people, I think, uh, would have been quite indifferent to the question of United Ireland uh, quite a number of years ago. But actually, the independence movement, I think, in Scotland has opened up people's eyes to that. And you see a lot of people now actually see their fight in a common cause uh, to what's happening in Ireland in, in support of United Ireland in a way they wouldn't have done uh, a number of years ago. So I think that's another, uh, another important development uh, in Scotland. But the, there does seem to me, and it's, and it's come out, and I thought about it in terms of the speeches that have just been made, the two central questions we've got in Scotland are, what kind of Scotland do we want when we become independence? Become independent, and how do we get it? And I think there's lessons that's coming out of the struggle in, uh, <coughs> uh, uh, in Ireland for us. Because you, if you want real radical change, then it means mass struggle. It means working class people actively involved uh, in the struggle, not the sort of half-hearted, legalistic uh, attempts that are being made by the SNP leadership just now. And in some respects, parallel uh, the kind of nationalist leaders in, in Ireland. You know, if we want real change, if we want mass involvement, then it's going to involve socialists actually encouraging that activity on the ground from below that's going to bring us something that's actually worthwhile, uh, not just another pale imitation of, a, of, of the Southern Ireland. Which, by the way, which uh, Nicola Sturgeon and Lloyds as an example that Scotland should actually follow, uh, you know, so yeah, it's, it's about the struggle comrades, yes. Um, I'll, I'll give over to, I'll give over to you with the mic already. Okay. Um, thanks. Um, first of all, uh, very quickly, I think, uh, I, I thank Eamon for the uh, discussion about the railway because the railway is exceptionally important. I mean, if you read Trotsky's history of the Russian Revolution, he talks about the importance of the railway for the development of capitalist society. And I mean, there's loads of discussions about the railway in, in, in terms of development of industrial capital. If you read all sorts of Marxist literature, it is a vastly important um, feature of, um, of, of the Industrial Revolution and the development of imperialism and all the rest of it. Um, so yeah, we should we should have means about the railway comrades. <laughs> um, secondly, um, we uh, Richard talked about um, the damage that uh, sectarianism can do, um, and uh, I mean yeah, Tuppence taking looking down on Tuppence. That's that's a great way of putting it. The other thing is I would quote Tony, quote Tony Cliff, who um, said, "When you're on your way down, you look for someone to kick. When you're on your way up, you look for a bat to pat." 
And that's the damage that sectarianism can do. Um, because what, what happens is, P Protestant work, the Protestant working class was put down and kicked and forced, it, forced down by, by the Irish state. And that means that they, uh, when, when um, the, uh, the state uh, created this sectarianism, that was really a really successful way of dividing people and making people feel powerful, even, if they, even though they weren't. Um, and that's why that united struggle is so important. Um, and finally, I want to I want to ask a question. I know I'm speaking a lot. Um, I want to ask a question. So I think the work you do in People Before Profit is absolutely amazing, and it's great to follow it from afar. Like I, I, I watch Richard's speeches back all the time and stuff like that. But um, is that being translated into uh, a revolutionary movement as part of the Socialist Worker Network? I don't know. Thanks. <laughs> Um, I think we have the back. Right. Um, yeah, we're going to left or right? Uh, the back there. And then I think we'll be able to have one more contribution after that before we come back to our speakers. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. Um, I want uh, the, 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 the point Richard made about sorry, the point Richard made about the idea that eventually the Catholics could outbreed Protestants was a strong theme of inevitability. There is a slight inevitability, I think, not from ours and our comrades in Ireland, but a sort of guardian world view that as Ireland gets more and more progressive, as progressive ideas take over, that seamlessly the capitalist United Ireland will arrive, the sunny uplands of liberalism will be achieved, be, and maybe so the dinosaurs of the DUP will just die off. It's not quite the same as our freedom, but it is the idea that liberal issues gaining force is enough to drive us to United Ireland. I don't think that's true. I think that point about struggle is absolutely central. And the idea, an old idea of socialism in the 1930s in Ireland, that sectarianism dies quickly when there's struggle. It does not die at all when there is no struggle. And that, I think, is important for socialism in Britain, for one very simple reason. It was the British ruling class that created the mess in the first place. It is the British ruling class who are about to recreate the mess on the basis of Boris Johnson playing fast and loose with the politics of Northern Ireland to stay in office. For no other reason. To hold to his highs over the Tory party. That does have the potential to reignite. Sometimes it loses signal, but it will come back. <laughs> <laughs> Just keep talking. Yeah. Uh, okay, cool. Um, the Wallace um, Johnson's ability to try and cling on to power in the Conservative Party, to, which, and uh, disregarding the fact that their ability to whip up sectarianism. It's right that unionism was a great deal weaker, in also far, much, much weaker than it ever was before. But to misquote someone, it hasn't gone away. And it offers the potential. And it is the working class that suffer from those divisions. So while I don't believe for a second that a return to violence is on the cards, I don't believe that sectarianism will drift off. I think there's a struggle not just for progression, but a struggle against sectarian divisions within the working class. And I think that's a part we can play here by protesting vociferously about the way the Tories try and use this and rely on it yet again. If you could make a contribution uh, quick so we have time for everyone to be back. Okay, thanks. Uh, John Molyneux, um, editor of Irish Marxist Review. As a, um, a Brit who moved to Ireland, uh, I think there's actually in Britain there's very little reporting of Irish politics and consequently a lot of misunderstandings. So I wanted to reply to the comment from the team who asked about people before profit because I, I just think lots and lots of Comrades here don't understand what people call profit is. It's not a campaign, it's not a united front, it's a political party, it's a radical left political party, the main radical left uh, party in Ireland, north and south, and it is led by revolutionary socialists. That's very, very important. The steering committee of people before profit has an SWN majority on it, and almost everybody on the steering committee is a revolutionary socialist. We have four TDs, MPs, that is, in the door, one of whom is uh, Richard. All four are revolutionary socialists. Three of them are members of the Socialist Workers Network. 
uh, and so on. We have one MLA in the North, member of the Legislative Assembly, also a member of the SWF, also a revolutionary socialist. So it's not an alliance between a group of uh, revolutionaries with a reformist majority or anything like that. I just think that's important. Thing. Yeah. Last thing uh, I will say again, I wonder if people realize that the opinion polls are like in the Republic at the moment. Sinn Fein stand on 36%, Fina Gale on 20%, and Fina Foyle on 17%. Fina Gale and Fina Foyle have between them ruled the state as long as it has existed. And they are now in a minority. Sinn Féin is way ahead uh, uh, of them. And that is political dynamite. Sinn Féin are not as left-wing as people think they are. They're not revolutionaries at yeah. all. But nevertheless, objectively, that's important. And yeah, and my last point is simply this, that uh, United Ireland, the breakup of the British state, is not just of significance in Ireland or in Britain, but is of global significance. The, the empire on which the sun never set becomes the kingdom of England and Wales, with Wales a bit doubtful. <laughs> To uh, sum up and reply to some people's questions, and then I'll bring Ed okay. back in um, if we can get him on the Zoom. So you, you've got about seven oh, yeah. minutes to. Okay. Speak? Yeah. yeah, great. Uh, yeah, so it, it, unionism won't just disappear uh, because of a sort of gradual evolution of a more liberal southern state. Absolutely, uh, absolutely correct. And uh, it, it most certainly won't if you. Uh, don't, and this is my point about Connolly, if you don't have an active group, an organized group, and of course he left a huge legacy, so if I, uh, if, I was, if I misphrase that, my point is there was no substantial size party with critical mass that could, uh, could take forward the revolutionary socialist uh, perspective in a moment when it was very much on the agenda internationally and where it was uh, uh, where there was real possibilities in Ireland itself, North and South. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, Connolly hadn't left a sizable organisation. And what did exist, the Labour Party took this appalling line. I mean, you know, to the extent that Connolly himself was on death row, they didn't even, even campaign for his release. I mean, it's just absolutely shocking stuff, right? So, you know, the betrayals of... Labour style politics and the official trade union movement go, you know, that deep uh, in Ireland. But yeah, absolutely. So the question is, have you got an organised force of revolutionary socialists with critical mass uh, to challenge the rotten politics of uh, obviously the southern state? Because even now, although unionism is fractured, it is weaker than ever. Uh, the story that Eamon told about uh, Peter Robinson's daughter and so on, and that gives you an indication of that fractioning, fractioning and weakening of unionism. But is that does it mean it's just inevitably going to disappear and collapse? No. You first of all, you have to have an alternative, uh, and uh, the obviously the the conservative right wing neoliberal politics of the southern still. I mean, we are making huge headway. The radical left is growing. Sinn Féin, as, uh, as uh, 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 John said, you know, this is quite extraordinary given uh, the, you know, how they've been demonised uh, by the conservative uh, political establishment. Um, but uh, they themselves are looking for an opportunity. In fact, they won't rule out coalition. I mean, they're attacking left in the South, often under pressure from us and more importantly from the movements. I mean, one of the important things to say about that moment, because I was, I was up on the platform when Mary Lou grabbed that placard, and I can tell you, my impression of it was she was, you know, if, if you like, it was the movement that had created this, this moment. Because Sinn Féin were quite iffy on the issue, very iffy, that's putting mildly, very iffy on the issue. They weren't very active on the ground, on the campaign. They were divided among themselves at many points. You know, ultimately, Mary Lou Macdonald, the leadership fame did come out fairly strongly on it, but believe, you know, you, you wouldn't have trusted them with the movement. And it was, it, it was the revolutionary socialists, if you like, who were on the ground, 
building the, the grassroots campaign. Uh, so, and that still, you know, remains the case. And, and one of the key points we're constantly making, although we're glad to see Sinn Féin doing well, we are actively promoting the idea of a left government and the possibility for the first time in Southern history that Fianna Fáil and Fianna Gael will not be part of the government of the South. For the first time in history. That's a very exciting prospect. And that's why there's a huge surge for Sinn Féin, because people see that. And that is a left sentiment. It's driven by the huge success of the water charges campaign, again, which was the socialists were the key on the ground in organising and building, and which they were forced, to some extent, Sinn Féin, were forced into supporting the boycott civil disobedience campaign, which at the outset they didn't support. But they were put under pressure by us on the ground, building the civil disobedience campaign of boycott, and then by enjoying some electoral success, which was also putting pressure uh, on them on their left flank. Right? So that subjective political factor is absolutely cr uh, uh, critical in deciding the outcome of this. And why on earth would that group of people who are breaking from unionism uh, join a state that still, despite the successes we've won, Still, the, the Catholic Church controls 90% of the schools, still controls huge amounts of the health service, uh, where we have one of the worst housing crises in, in Western Europe at the moment. It's an absolute disaster, right? Uh, uh, you know, where we've got the rotten legacy of corruption at so many levels, right? They're not, why do they want to join that? Right, so if we're going to uh, uh, d d fully dismantle sectarianism and unionism is only on the basis of a very radical struggle from below of a united Ireland, to put it in Eamon's uh, phrase. He's absolutely right. Uh, you know, the railways is such a good example of that, but so is repeal, so is the cost of living at the moment. I mean, one of the things we are doing is trying to build a big, broad coalition around uh, agitation, around the cost of living, i.e. demanding pay increases for workers, income increases for people, radical action on housing, radical action on free public transport, and so on and so forth, right? And again, we have put pressure on Sinn Féin to become part of that coalition. We've now put sufficient pressure on, in terms of agitation from the bottom up to now the Irish Congress of Trade Unions, who've been holding back on holding any kind of demonstrations against the housing and cost of living prices, have now been forced to endorse our cost of living coalition. Uh, and I'll just finish on the peak before profit point. You see, is, is this, uh, I mean, the, I suppose the implication of the question is, are we somehow building something that's a bit, you know, diluting the revolutionary politics uh, and moving us slightly away from our, our revolutionary focus on struggle from below? And I would say absolutely not. The whole point of peak before profit is we are using it as a, a, a way to agitate for movements on the, on, uh, from the bottom, right? And to put that struggle from below perspective, but it does give us a platform in order to organize resistance from the bottom up. Uh, so, and it's growing. I mean, it's growing, people on the ground is growing, and then it's very, very easy as people join because they're involved in the agitations around repeal, around the housing crisis, industrial agitation, and so on. And we're, we're very upfront about saying we're revolutionary socialists. We're part of the SWN. It actually creates and has created an audience to recruit people then directly into revolutionary, uh, into revolutionary politics. So that subjective factor, an emphasis on struggle from below and on building struggles on an all-Ireland basis, struggles of a united Ireland, whether it's on the trains, whether it's on the cost of living, whether it's on water charges, whether it's on uh, abortion rights, whether it's on the uh, climate crisis and so on. And that is the way we can actually uproot sectarianism, end partition uh, and uh, move us towards a socialist Ireland. <laughs>now you can oh very good uh there's a couple of minutes in one so i'm going to just scatter through uh and a scattergun approach to a few things uh 
Uh, there's loads of points being made there that I would like to speak about certainly for 10 minutes each, but that's not a uh, possible. So, and I agree with everything in the summation given uh, by Richard there, so there's no point uh, in me repeating it. So it's just a couple of uh, observations I want to make sort of about the struggle in Ireland. Uh, most people don't associate the struggle uh, in Ireland with 1968 sort of and uh, the world, the great upsurge sort of around the world and so forth. Indeed, sort of my friend and comrade, uh, Tony Galley wrote a book about 1968 in which he didn't mention Northern Ireland at all in the Civil Rights Book but from start to finish. He didn't uh, mention it. And what was really strange about that is that Tariq was in Northern Ireland at the time of the Civil Rights Movement and I went around some of the uh, demonstrations with him. And yet he didn't think that it fitted in. All these years later, he didn't think it fitted in. It was happening it fitted into uh, uh, what was happening around the world. So just let me say very briefly, we've got, if you look in uh, a... A, 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 there's a, a symbol or sort of an artifact, whatever you would call it, very well known in Ireland, which is a wall in Derry, and it says on it, you're now entering Free Derry. And uh, I, it's a Free Derry wall, uh, uh, we call it. So I'm, I'm just going to say a couple of words about how that came to be there. That was put there, sort of, it's now interpreted as uh, to do with Free Ireland and as to do with nationalism. It was not put there to deal with nationalism at all or to express nationalism. Far from it. It was put there, the slogan you're now entering for Derry was taken by me. I put that slogan there, at least I came up with it and suggested that somebody uh, write it on the wall. Uh, it was taken from Berkeley College in California, where in 1956, there was what was called the Berkeley Free Speech Movement, associated with Lenny Glazer, sort of, and other people. Lenny came over about 10 years ago. I was pictured with it in front of the wall. But a, a, and the, a, a, we took that from uh, a... The United States. We took it from California, and the uh, uh, and that reflected sort of what was happening. Sort of that the people had a sense sort of, of being involved on a much wider basis than being sort of a, a that, that, that than in Ireland only. And it's a, and this was true. Of course, it's not sort of imagining. It wasn't sort of a flight of fancy on behalf sort of of nostalgic socialists or anything like that. I mean, this was actually true. It was part of something worldwide that was happening. We often forget that. That noises. And if you look at the uh, uh, advances made in the first few years of the civil rights movement, they're actually quite dramatic. When we talk about Northern Ireland being, as indeed it was, a sectarian state in which there were no civil rights, sort of generally speaking, sort of from the entirety, uh, uh, from the entirety uh, uh, of the of the population, it is also that's true. It's all it's also true. But it is also true that in the wider part of effort, if you actually look at the changes that came about in the earliest years of the civil rights movement, what were its demands? The abolition of the B specials, which is a paramilitary section of the police force, uh, basically sort of not being controlled by anybody. That was ended in nineteen seventy one. Uh, the abolition of discrimination in employment against Catholics. That was ended by 1972. Uh, the, uh, uh, a, a whole series of others, or the, a, a, the unfair boundaries which were drawn so that minorities in places like Derry, a minority group of unionists, could actually elect a majority of members of the local council. That was abolished sort of in the first couple of years. So the point I'm making is if you look back to sort of how things changed and how things created the situation what we're in at the moment, on no occasion was it armed struggle. On no occasion did either armed struggle or parliamentary uh, uh, manoeuvring achieve anything significant for the mass of people in it. What worked was mass struggle. That's what worked, and that's been worked ever since. And you can see that we were talking a, 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 a just some minutes ago. I mean, about uh, the oppression of women and the oppression of gay people and the campaign sorry, for abortion rights and so on. All of those are based on mass struggle. Let me give you sort of one other. Just stop me. Uh, well, you have to. I just ramble along. The uh, uh, the the a, 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 you look sort of at uh, what was happening. In mass struggle, the way people change is they always change, sort of in terms a, of mass struggle and move on to, if you like, a higher or even means the same thing, sort of a, a deeper lessons um, and so forth. You can see sort of that the uh, that that the truth and the solution was always there, standing us and staring us uh, in the face, and still is, and still is. You know, it's a, 
a, a, a what happened sort of in the North End, the people who didn't go along sort of with the mass uh, uh, movement for change in Northern Ireland were, among others, among others, were Republicans. By Republicans, sort of, I mean Sinn Féin and other sort of groups with Sinn Féin in their names and so forth. They didn't go along with it at all. They thought this was, a, a they thought this is sort of nothing to do with the United Ireland question. Therefore, we are not uh, uh, interested in it. And sort of by within four years of the civil rights movement, there's an awful lot of nationalists in Northern Ireland who have decided, you know, and there's understandable reasons for this. I've got time to go into the context sort of in which uh, uh, these things happen. The idea of armed struggle for a united Ireland had entirely replaced the idea of mass struggle from below for changes in the North, which had a potential, at least, to unite uh, working class. Uh, to make the, uh, a, the working class in the North. So all these things, I mean, uh, a, are facets of the way things were developing. I mean, it's difficult to, to just express them all sort of in a single second. The point is that the situation in Northern Ireland, from a class point of view, has always been far, far more complicated than the way it has been uh, commonly, uh, a, commonly, a, commonly presented. You know, it's a, 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 we're talking, it's true, Sort of, I mean, about the way we have to confront the uh, British ruling class when we're dealing with oppression, sort of in Northern Ireland. That's where it uh, aim actually leads, uh, and so forth. The British ruling class has never wanted Northern Ireland. Never. It has tactically and strategically at times. Of course, it has bounded itself to uh, a union uh, in the North. It has never really wanted Northern Ireland. After partition, within four years of partition, the leader of Ulster Unionism, Lord Edward Carson, the unchallenged leader of unionism at that time, said publicly, it wasn't worth it. We have been betrayed. The British Tory party has used us. He specified the Tory party has used us unionists for its own purposes. 2022, what's the British Tory government doing to the unionists in the North? Why is there such resentment uh, uh, against them? And the reason is that they have been betrayed again. The protocol and all this that we talk about the intransigence of the DUP, and that's absolutely 100% true. But the protocol does cut off Northern Unionists from England, Scotland, and Wales. Of course it does. If you have customs barriers along a place and you can't pass over it without having a customs uh, force, I uh, can you stamp your goods and so on. That is a distancing of one part of any uh, a polity a, 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 a from another. So you've got, so the Unionist Party has created, a uh, Tory party mainly, has created a monster in Northern Ireland, which they're now finding it difficult to control. And of course, as uh, befits a, a, a Tory party, they are lying in all directions about it. I mean, Boris Johnson was here, uh, what, about two years ago? Just after he became Prime Minister, he told a Unionist uh, meeting in Belfast, he says, don't worry about these people saying that there's going to be a border down the Irish Sea. Don't worry about borders and all the rest of it. We are absolutely committed to retaining Northern Ireland as an integral part of the United Kingdom with no difference in law or entitlements between Northern Ireland and the rest. He said that. You know, so he says, if anybody comes to you, he says, what's the document? And says, you're crossing a border now. You've got to sign this or comport a, 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 a trade border or anything else. Tell them to put it in the bin. As they said, now, of course, he's orchestrating sort of a thing where a border controls are actually part of it. Now, British Tories have betrayed the Unionists yet, yet again. They've always done it. So it, when you begin to talk about Northern Ireland and what to do about it, I think there's a big market, so to speak, in Britain for that, that type of analysis. And to say, uh, I, you know, to people, sort of that the idea, I said, so I don't have time to go down the road I was about to go uh, down. The idea of the integrity of the state sort of, mm -hmm. is, is a busted flush in Ireland, on the island, uh, a, the, uh, on the island of Ireland, and will, uh, a, and will remain so. There's no sort of basic, a, a basic, one last thing, one very last thing. You know, when we talk about the history of uh, how partition came about and all the rest of it, there are economic underpinnings for that. It wasn't just that the unionists were sectarian and so forth. If you look back to the 1920s when all this happened, you know, uh, Belfast was an industrialized uh, town. In terms of its economy and its industry, it resembled uh, a Liverpool or Birmingham far more than it resembled Dublin, far more than it resembled uh, Dublin. Its markets and sources of raw material were across the water. The empire provided sort of chief imports uh, uh, and all the rest. And it, uh, Northern industrialists, uh, Carson didn't understand this, but Northern industrialists had an objective economic interest in maintaining the link with Britain. 
That's the uh, economic basis. So, uh, whereas in Southern Ireland, where people needed in the ruling class in Southern Ireland, needed to break with England. And that was expressed when David Lear came to power in 1938, a thing called the Protection of Manufacturers Act, which laid down that 50% plus one of all new investment had to be Irish investment. Keep the Brits out. David Lear said, burn everything English except their coal. You know, so there you have the, the two sections of the ruling class expressing their own sort of uh, particular interest, their own particular economic interest, and expressing it in terms sort of, of the ancient politics and fairly ancient politics uh, uh, of Ireland. You can't understand partition unless you understand that. And you can't understand how the partition has weakened as well, unless you understand the way in which the economy is. What possible reason could there be for any intelligent section of the capitalist class you know, to uh, say that they want to retain Northern Ireland within the uh, United Kingdom and not letting it go. Where's the economic reason for that? There's no economic reason for it. You know, maybe individual ties. There's no bi a, a broad economic reason for it. And that's the context in which we have to see things today. All the history of the early civil rights movement, what was happening in the 1920s to what's happening right now, all the history shows that, that uh, a... A, 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 that the only thing which cuts through, of course we know this, to be common sense to us, that is actually mass struggle for progressive uh, uh, God, I can't pass one. Uh, sorry about that. I mean, sorry, they, they, unless you're fighting on a socialist basis, on a class basis, you will never get a united Ireland that's worth having. Of course you can get a united Ireland. You can change boundaries all the time. But from a working class point of view, will it be worth having? Will it be worth the struggle? I'm going to leave you sort of with this, uh, this thought. I mean, that's a very pertinent question because where I'm sitting, where I live, there's an awful lot of people around this area who have served long terms in prison for IRA or ANLA activity. Sorry, everyone. Thank you for coming to the session. I hope you have a good lunch. <laughs>